The Perimeter is brought to you in partnership with Speak Studios. Speak Studios. Speak and be heard. The Perimeter with Adam Morrison is brought to you by our official title sponsor, Mercedes-Benz of Spokane. Experience the best or nothing at Mercedes-Benz of Spokane with Dan Crowley and his exceptional team. They're located in beautiful Liberty Lake and his local family-owned dealership under Gee Automotive. Their staff prides itself on a personable and memorable experience from service to sales and will have you leaving the dealership feeling satisfied with a smile on your face all the way down the road. Back-to-back winners of the Best of the Best Civil Laurel Award receive invoice pricing on any new Mercedes-Benz in stock when you come in and mention the Perimeter Podcast. You can check out all their available inventory at SpokaneMercedes.com as well. Stay up to date on all things Mercedes-Benz via their Facebook and Instagram pages. Call them at 509-455-9100 to schedule your Mercedes test drive today. The Perimeter brings no lie craft brews onto the podcast. Born and raised in Spokane, USA, No Lie Brewhouse is a hometown and international competitor made here. Their beers have traveled and won medals against the best breweries around the world. Over 46 international brewing medals and counting. They are not content, and they're always pushing forward to peak results. Grab a sixer, and let's get into the podcast. Welcome to the Perimeter Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Morrison. I got Matt Santangelo, second (laughs) all-time leader in assists at Gonzaga University, 2000 AP Honorable Mention, Executive Director of Who Fest of Spokane. Spokane AU as well, right? Yep. So, yeah, thanks for coming on. Former player, we'll get into that. Um, What is the biggest um, thing that you worry about just to get into it right away, as a Spokane AU guy, what's the biggest complaint that you always get? Because I gave you a complaint on the phone the other day. <laughs> Yours wasn't a complaint. Yours was more of a special request. We yeah. get lots of those too. Um, the biggest one we struggle with is always has to do with officiating. It's a judgment call. I mean, just you know, as, as you know, um, the biggest concern I have is the have and have nots of youth sports. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially, you know, Spokane AAU, which is a program that comes out of our office, uh, is actually a season older than Hoop Fest. So it's 32 years old. Hoop wow. Fest will turn 32 this year. Um, and for some reason in Spokane, it kind of replaced school basketball. Uh, long 32 years ago just re- it became the the five yeah. on five youth basketball league aau in itself kind of has a negative connotation you know it could be the hoop fest rec league for what it is yeah you know, it's just local youth basketball mm-hmm. but the challenge around that is is like now you have the super teams you yeah. have the have and have not you were just telling me about in your daughter's division a huge blowout mm-hmm. like a unconscionable blowout yeah and so what happens is you, less kids play you know, unless you're already good when you show up or you happen to get lucky and mm-hmm. get a good team or maybe you have a parent that coaches and kind of knows what they're doing. Yeah. Um, well, that's 1%. Mm-hmm. The other 99 don't get serviced. You know, they end, end up on the end of the bench or they don't have access True. to the real value of the game because not everyone gets to play it at the level you played it at. And mm-hmm. if you get to play it at the level I got to play it at. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's my biggest fear for basketball in Spokane is like how do we continue to maintain access to the sport so that more kids uh, can reap the benefits of, of team sport and specifically basketball. What is that? What would solve that? Cause it's club obviously. So it's pay to play. Yep. Do you think there's ever a time in this country? I, I doubt it, but that it would ever turn to more, you know, uh, government ran programs, local government run programs, yeah. things like that. Cause there are like YMCA programs and stuff. Yeah. that's almost like free, but Competitive level is not there. Not there, and I think I think there's a, an opportunity maybe to rewrite the jurisdiction. Like, could you go back to neighborhood uh, ball? You know, in yeah. essentially school district teams, yeah, and offer that up. So you're always going to have the super teams, right? You're always going to have the kids that are going to excel that, yeah. that want to play in summer, that play year round. Mm-hmm. Um, but you don't have to have that in order to play basketball. It's true. And the pyramid gets so steep. It gets, and for our kids, it gets so steep at eighth grade. You go into high school, and all of a sudden, that those roster spots, those available opportunities yeah. to play basketball, are really, really limited. 
Uh, and so how do you, again, create more opportunity? Maybe it's more high school kind of rec leagues, mm-hmm. high school club leagues that aren't the traveling, you know, the elite teams. Yeah. Um, you know, just create more opportunity so that kids can stay engaged. And, um, you know, just because you're not a varsity high school basketball player, even at that level, doesn't mean you don't love the game of basketball. It doesn't mean you don't get a right to play. And, and all you have stuff. a right to play. So yeah. how, And so organizations like ours, um, you know, trying to find ways for either through sponsorship or the proceeds of an event like Hoop Fest, yeah. that, you know, generate a lot of money. Um, you know, how do we create that access point for other p- kids in our community? So you grew up in Portland, correct? Yep. Portland yep. area. So what AU team did you play for back yeah. then? Because it was different. You know, I've had, I had this discussion with Corey Kispert, IAE, um, you know, uh, of recruiting process. And it was different when you and I were coming up without yep. social media. Yeah. You know what I mean? You had to be more seen. And then the advent of these super traveling teams were kind of new, especially in Spokane. So what, what team did you play for? Yeah, local. So school ball during the school year. Yeah. And then summer ball, I started out with a group called Portland Magic. And it mm-hmm. was just like a, a family that wanted their kids to play. So they built a team. Yeah. And I got invited to play. And like, you know, like you, I kind of joke around with media, especially around Gonzaga is like, oh my gosh, you, you know, our group had a pretty good time with the media. We had yeah. some smart asses. We had some people that were a little more, you know, that, that fell into it a little easier, but we were just so happy. People wanted to talk to us. Yeah. Like we didn't, we weren't picky. Like, Oh my gosh, you want to talk to us? Yeah. Well, that's how AAU was like, Oh, you want to come play for us? Wait, you want me to play basketball for you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll do that. And then ultimately about seventh grade, I got hooked up with a group called triple threat and triple threat was, uh, out of the Portland area was, was as strong as any AAU team mm-hmm. on the West coast. Uh, and so we, but back then you had to go win state. And then you had, yeah, you had to, to go qualify, win regionals. Yeah. And then you went to nationals. You know, yeah. we traveled to go to nationals. It wasn't a showcase tournament every week. And you don't, as a coach, you don't know where to go. Is this it's tournament better, legit? Yeah. Is this better? Who's, who's watching that? Back then it was, there was an easier, you know, a straight, more straightforward path, not necessarily an easier one. Uh, but that's what we did. And so for two years in a row, we ended up in the final four in AAU nationals oh, wow. and Tennessee and uh, Virginia uh, and so we just had a nice squad, and it kind of was the, what catapulted me into that idea of a, of a higher level of basketball. So when when you were coming up, like what what schools were recruiting you? Uh, out of high school, my final five were University of Oregon, Stanford, Rice, Northwestern, and Gonzaga. Gonzaga. Yep. Uh, who was your recruiter? Uh, out of GU, yeah, Fitz and Few. Fitz and Few. Yep. Yep. So give me give me a, a, a taste for the listeners, like. Young coach few with his frosted tips, <laughs> five foot one. Yeah, what was his pitch like to you? Uh, his pitch was just like, um, and it, I don't think it's changed much. It's like here's an opportunity for you to come be who you're going to be. Yeah, like we believe in you. You know, we think we think you could be a good player. You yeah, know, you're not one now, but we think you could be. Yeah, uh, and and ultimately, you know, it's going to be on you to come work. But at that time. I mean, it was really Fitz's show. You know, you talk oh, yeah, about, for sure. Um, you know, you know the history of the program well enough, but for a lot of the newcomers, that's one name that they don't necessarily identify with. Well, it's like a basketball. It's just, it's a shaky subject. <laughs> and we know that towards the end of his career, he did a lot for Gonzaga basketball, growing it, got it to the level with the recruiting. 95 was the first NCAA tournament uh, appearance. And then with Fitz camp that you run, we can yep. talk about that a little bit later. Yep. So he's done a lot, rest in peace, uh, Coach Fitz, for the Spokane basketball. But, it, you know, he had the yeah the one issue. So, yep, I mean, so it's always kind of funny when you bring his name up around to certain people. Certain people, and they kind of go like, ooh, that's, yeah. you can't really talk about it. Unfortunately, a lot, in addition to all the things he did for basketball, that kind of that zag quality, that toughness, mm-hmm. that Steve Hurts mentality, yeah. like kind of the old guard, that culture that we're all proud of as, as former players. Yeah. Um, you know, he had a lot to say in that and mm-hmm. building that foundation as well. And of course, coach few just, you know, ran with it. To, so when you got rights. there, did you redshirt? Were you, I redshirt. Yeah. Yep. Most Seven. guys do that back then. Now it's like, I don't, it's uh, like insulting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. totally. Uh, I was a 17 year old uh, college freshman, oh, a okay. September baby, so really young, really skinny. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And so, and then we had a senior guard, Kyle Dixon. Dixon was a good player. Um, was a good player. And then that was kind of the the map. The road map was like, hey, red shirt, and then step right into it as a freshman. Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately, that's what happened. So you were a freshman of the year, correct? Yep. Uh, was it co or? Complete. Yeah, co with Brian Jones from Santa Clara. Yeah. It was only because Santa Clara was dominating back then, so they that's had a, to keep the Bay Area <laughs> involved. That's after the Steve Nash era, though, yep. man. I remember how good that team. I remember going to a Steve Nash game. 
uh, when I was ball boy there, I think it was 95. He yep. had like 30 something. Yep. Yeah. Do you, that was my retro year. That was, was his, was Steve's senior year. So my, I got to see that yeah, one. My dad too. was like, that guy's going to be in the NBA. And I was like, oh, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, and totally. Like, oh, I ended up playing against him, obviously. And I was watching <laughs> him, but it was just like, where does this guy come from? And yeah. All that stuff. So take us through the first 99 run. I know you've told a lot of these stories, but you know, that team was the next or the genesis of the Gonzaga run. And what was the locker room like during that whole year? Everybody says we want to make a run. We, we think we're going to win champ. What were you guys goals at the start of the year? Honest goals. Honest goals was just to get to the tournament, just to get to the so tournament. So back then, like with the West coast conference tournament, you had three games in three days. Mm-hmm. It didn't matter if you were zero and twenty five going into that weekend or twenty five and zero. Yeah, like at that point, it that was it irrelevant. Matter, yeah, if yeah. you won those three games, you know, yep. salvation, right? Mm-hmm. You you made it. And I think, in, in it, on the flip side, if you were twenty five and zero and you didn't win those three games, it didn't matter. You didn't weren't matter. getting in the tournament. Yeah, it didn't matter. No tool. Yep. And so I think for us, the goal was always those three games. I mean, mm-hmm. we conditioned for it in the summer. You were thinking three three games in three days. We're, we're, this is what we're working for. Yeah. And so the actual, you know, that group really got started in 97, 98, which would have been Munson's first year as head coach. Okay. We were probably better that year. We had Bakari Hendricks. We ended yeah, up Bakari's, being player of the year, yeah. which is a beast. Um, you know, and we had kind of the rest of the hallmark because our group were five, five players, mm-hmm. me, Richie Fromm, Ryan Floyd, Mike Nielsen, Axel Dench. So that was kind of our core freshman group all the way through. And so uh, that 97-98, what changed when Fitz handed it down to Munson or that transition took place and Munson and Few and Coach Greer took a more prominent role is they just scheduled differently. Yeah. Like, you know, Fitz was kind of still trying to get to that 20 wins, you know, the school of the blind and the sisters Mm. of the poor (laughs) and the, you know, all that stuff. Where, you know, Munson and, and Few and Greer came in and said, like, why can't we go place? We, we, we go to Kansas. We go to the top yeah. of the world classic. We go to Michigan State. I mean, they loaded us up, and we just happened to be good enough to go, or maybe naive enough to think we could go in and win some of these games yeah. and we were competitive. And so that was kind of the, the you know, it started to roll. And so we won conference in 97-98. We lose to San Francisco in the conference tournament championship. So to the point was, you know, we didn't get in. We thought we had built a resume, but uh, didn't get a second shot as a one bid league. And so we go to the NIT, we go down to Wyoming and win in Wyoming, and then we lose in Hawaii uh, against U of H. I, I think oh, I you had to go all the way to Hawaii. Hawaii yeah. Laramie, if, then Hawaii. Wow. Laramie, then Hawaii, right? <laughs> I held Anthony Carter to 30, I think, that game. Oh, yeah, it's like, D. yeah, he uh, <laughs> uh, just crushes. But if you have to end your season, Hawaii is not the worst place to end it. Um, great point <laughs> like honestly yeah great point. We were just sitting on the beach afterwards going like why are we so angry like yeah, this just, isn't so bad uh gulp, gulp, gulp. yeah, yeah exactly I mean. and so uh so that next year we came back so to answer your question all that summer long we're like take it out of everyone's hands win conference win the tournament win conference yeah. win the tournament and so we came in and that was the motto once we did that we beat santa clara on their home floor uh pretty handily uh so we get the automatic bid after that, we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. And so we were, I mean, back to being naive, like we had no clue mm-hmm. uh, what to expect with the NCAA tournament. What, if it was it fair to think we could win a game? We didn't, it didn't even matter. We were kind of on, and you know. Well, I think that year was that the Minnesota debacle yep. with, on their side. So that gave you guys momentum, obviously. But then you ended up beating Stanford in the second round, yep. which was Mark Madsen, like a really good Final Four caliber team. Yeah. So after you win that, were you guys like, Fuck it, you know, just like <laughs> yeah. house money type of stuff. Absolutely, like, yeah, yep, absolutely. But you always had this little kind of this sense of like we shouldn't be done. Like the more we had success, even Minnesota than Stanford, is like I don't know the snowball effect or mm-hmm. momentum or something. Is like it was like wait a second, we we should continue winning. Yeah, like, one it was like this is fun. Like why why go home now? Yeah, and two is like oh shit, we can do this. Yeah, and we can do it at the highest level. So it was like this. I just remember the, the, some of those games, like, I don't think we should be done yet. And like yeah. looking at Mike Nielsen, who was my roommate, going like, I, I don't think we're done yet. Yeah. And it just kind of kept rolling. But, I mean, as you know, like that tournament, that second weekend, like the the time frame, the speed of everything that coming at you, the media attention, the spotlight that yeah. is that NCAA tournament. I mean, we were just drinking Especially from a for, fire hose. Yeah, for, for you guys, because it was obviously brand new. And then it was um, just an explosion of recognition. I mean, obviously Spokane – supported Gonzaga, but not even close to the level. Of, no. You, you know that. Yep. And so, like, now it's like everybody's like, oh, we loved you guys. Like, you haven't been to a game yet this year, yeah. right? Or it, you walked to one kennel game and watched 
whomever and then went home early or whatever. You know what I'm right. saying? It kind of makes me salty when I see on Twitter when they're doing all the best of the best ofs and none of the old old guards involved, me included, because mm. I'm still young enough to have a Twitter account, so I'm yeah. not that old. But <laughs> And I'm going like, wait, and I always want to chime in like, what the? Come on, man, I could play. And yeah. so, uh, you know, but it's it's true. The, a, lot of, a lot of the people... Uh, we were the the part of that spark that made people the turn their attention to. Yeah, it. you were the genesis yeah. that 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 run. Um, did you think I should think that you could beat that UConn team? That UConn team ended up winning it that year, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Yep. It was Rip Hamilton, yeah. Clit Elamine, Jake Voskel, Voskel, Kevin Voskel. Freeman. I played with Voskel yeah. in um, Charlotte. Did you? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I ended up, uh, but uh, I remember, you know, obviously the tip in against Florida, but I remember that just that UConn games like. They actually have a chance to win this yeah. game. Wasn't it a close game? I yeah, can't remember. Uh, one possession with a minute left. We lost by five. Lost by five. Yeah. Wow. Closest game of their NCAA tournament. How did you play in those games? Awful. Really? Ricky Moore, who was the uh, off guard for UConn, deed me up. Yeah. I think I went, I went one. I don't think I did. I went one for nine. Yeah. Um, and actually kind of, you know, learned from it. But I went one for nine. Richie had a tough one, too. Quentin Hall was a beast. I think he had 18 on Clit Elamine. And really, you know, other guys stepped up to keep us in the game. Yeah. Um, and it came down to, yeah, within a minute to go, we were one possession. And I do remember after the Florida tip in with all the excitement, uh, which is one of my favorite kind of, uh, coach Munson NCA stories, but he comes into the locker room and we're, of course, we're all going crazy and jumping all over. And he's going like, you know, he's trying to keep us focused. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we, we just, you're whatever, 36 hours away from a yeah. chance to go to the final, final four. four. And he's going like, we just gotta, we just gotta. And then he runs his hand through his hair and he goes like, I don't know what we got to do. We'll figure it out tomorrow, you know, because it was like we'd never been there before. Yeah. Act like you've been there before. Like we had no context for what we were going through. Uh, and so then going into UConn, like going into Stanford, we knew if we played well, we'd had a, we had a chance. Yeah. Going into UConn, we said we had to play well, and we're not sure if we have a chance. Yeah, or not, no, it's one of those well. where you have to play perfectly, and they have to play. Yeah, not their worst game, but a downer game for them. Yeah, um, and I don't think they did. I thought we played well. We stood up to them, um, you know, and battled, and just you know didn't go our way. So the the next year, obviously, there's tremendous success in the in that run. You guys make it to the Sweet Sixteen, right? Yep. Okay, so like, what was the thought process going into that season? Obviously, you're gonna you know, probably similar answer, like, let's make the NCAA tournament again. But, like, there was a newfound spotlight. There was, a, you know, perception of winning at Gonzaga. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, what was the pressure like for that group? Because that was one of the most unheralded, like you mentioned earlier, things of, of Gonzaga basketball is, like, going to lead eight, then backing it up with a Sweet 16 being, you know, just a nobody school again, basically. Yeah. So, what was that like going into that? Because it was your who who was your class? It was yourself, Nielsen, Mike Nielsen, Ryan Floyd, Richie Fromm, yep. and Axel Dench. It all that came back. Five. That came yep. back that next and year. And then Casey Calvary and Mark Spink were the a year younger than us, yep. so they were on the Elite Eight team. Yep. And then we lost Quentin Hall and Jeremy, Jeremy Eaton, Eaton and yep. Mike Leisure, who was one of our senior leaders. Yep. That the year before. Um, the big battling cries, don't be a one-hit wonder. I mean, it's as simple as that. Really? Like, we did not want to be. We wanted us to really, we went, wanted to go from being a good team to a good program. And we wanted to be a part of that transition. And that was literally, we had the perspective to, to say that out loud. I mean, that's Well, not, and Fuey just took over that year. First year as head coach. So, I spent that summer, <laughs> I spent that summer on Team USA with Coach Munson. Yeah. So I'm coming off an Elite Eight, coming back into with, you know, four other mm-hmm. guys in Casey and Mark Spink. And I'm spending the summer with my head coach, Team USA, win a gold medal. I'm like, I'm rolling. Yeah. Like, I'm like, I got a chance here. If I have a good year, maybe I put myself in a position to to, to make it to the league. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the week after we get back from Spain, from the World University Games, months and bounces. Uh, and we run right back into Coach Few. So. How, was, how was that transition like? Because you know, I've always heard from other guys that he was kind of rolled the ball out that year for mm-hmm. you guys. Kind of just got the fuck out of the way. Was that true? Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah. yeah, I think I think with our well, one when Fitz left a couple years before, they really did divide out coaching responsibilities. Yeah. I mean, Munson was the head coach, but Few was the technician. Greer was the defensive guy. Yeah, you know, M- Munson was the keep it all together and work hard and compete yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. 
And so even when that transition happened, it felt pretty natural. I mean, Coach Few steps up. You know, he has a little bit more of the technical. But at that point, I mean, we ran flex and motion. Oh <laughs> I mean, no so level of uh, like sophistication like they do now. Zero. Um, and I, I sometimes I get mad at that, too. I got a lot of old Big Brother stories like, shit, why do they have to get all this gear? And we got no gear. And, yeah, you know, exactly. They get to run a pick and roll. We never ran a pick and roll. Never. I would have been – I was never. second in assist. I never ran a pick and roll in my <laughs> career. And, you know, so I get kind of salty <laughs> on some of this stuff. Uh, damn you, Josh Perkins. No, Josh Perks, my man. He's the one that broke that record. Um, and so, uh, but with few, like he, you know, it was very familiar. Yeah. So it wasn't like he was trying to do a whole lot. He had five, seven upperclassmen, five seniors. Yeah, so he, um, and so I don't think, I don't remember it being a lot of, um, you know, tinkering. I think he did he could give us a lot of freedom. And then yeah. we got lucky that year. We lost conference. We lost to Pepperdine. And we had to go uh, win the West Coast Conference Tournament to get in, or else we would have been a one-hit wonder, yeah. flash in the pan, and who knows how the run goes from there. Uh, but we were fortunate enough to go down to Santa Clara again for the West Coast Conference Tournament. Uh, we played three games in three days. I play 40, 80, and we go into overtime. So I play 128 minutes Jesus. in three games, never come out. Wow. Um, and Floyd stepped up huge in the Pepperdine game, and Casey was a beast in the championship, but we beat them in overtime to get the automatic bid and, and keep the run going. Yeah. That so was under Romar, and they had a squad, who, still Archie. And who'd you, who'd you guys beat that year in the tournament? We go, we send Denny Crum to retirement at Louisville. Oh, okay. Um, we're playing in Tucson. Uh, what's up, Tommy Lloyd? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, we beat St. John's. St. John's was, I thought, was one of our more interesting games because they were a two seed. Mm -hmm. They come off the Big East Conference Tournament Championship and literally going into the tournament, they were the hottest team in America. Yeah. And it's New York, man. It's against the Mecca. Yeah. And the year before we beat Stanford, they were a two seed, but it's like West Coast versus West Coast. No one gives a shit. Yeah. But like going into the heart of it all, like it was, and we beat them, and Spink was dunking on them, and Casey was dunking on them. And um, I had played with their point guard, Eric Barkley, on Team USA the summer before. Um, and so kind of there was some familiarity so you, there, and it was just an like, oh, what, gosh. What you were going to do. And, and so we go into that press conference afterwards. You got all the New York media sitting there, and they just look depressed. Yeah. <laughs> and I, my smart ass literally gets up and goes like, Man, I'm sorry for ruining your guys' day. I might have had a good game that game, Mo. Uh, and so uh, I, I just felt sorry for just – they just looked so sad, you know, because well, St. John's was going home. Yeah, they probably didn't uh, didn't think that you guys were going to do it again. <laughs> you know, I just remember those early years because it was like – you know, a lot of teams have a, a deep run, but then, to, like I said, to back it up, kind of obviously set the precedent for the program. And you guys were, what what did they do the year after? Was it Sweet 16 again? So they did, yeah. Casey's senior year, Dick Dickow's okay. first year, yeah. Sweet 16. And then Dick Dickow goes his senior year, yeah, they lose, in the, but then he's a, but he's a first-team All-American. Yeah. So even then it was the superlative, new, like crazy thing, yeah. you know. And then the following year, I think is when they lose to Arizona, and it's like this the greatest just, ever second round like, game. Yeah, like of all time. You know, and so it's yeah. like, what in the world is happening? Like every, even when they lose, they were kind of setting this new standard, this new precedent. Uh, and then you came along and yeah. took it to your own level. Yeah. No, it, there was, you know, like I said, you guys were the genesis and then there's been steps and now we're to a level where we're getting, you know, the number one <laughs> players in the country. Right. And guys are gonna be number one picks and all this crazy stuff, which is awesome for the program. It's like Holy shit, man! Right. I mean, twenty years—it's—it's it's pretty quick turnaround. I'm um, doing it the right way. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So, um, so you mentioned earlier about the the assist deal. So, give me your honest take here. How <laughs> how upset? Not upset is the wrong word, but like, I mean, everybody likes to have some accolades, and you yeah. have plenty of them. But like, were you a little bit stung when that one got broken? Yeah, yes and no. So when I, I when I broke it, I broke Stockton's. Yeah, that's the that's uh, you know. So like that's you. that's a little different. Perk only got to break mine. I got to break John's. Um, and so that one was. Uh, and I remember I talked to him. Steve O had him call, but this was pre cell phones, everyone. Yeah. Uh, but he had me call <laughs> in the training room, and Stockton's first response was, "It's about time." Oh, cool. You know, so like, no, I mean, he didn't even hype me up at all. Like yeah. total John stuff. Like it's about time. And so I had that example, you know. And so when Perk did it. You know, Pargo got close. Blake step would have had he stayed healthy. You know, so there. Well, we, when did he miss games though? Blake. Yeah. I, I, the folklore is that he was hurt all the time, 
and he was this wonderful player. Is that wrong? I was in Europe, so I didn't. Yeah, I no, didn't I, catch I all he, of these guys. My my freshman year, he played most of the game. So anyway, well, sorry. good. Maybe Blake wouldn't have broke it. Then. I don't think Take he was going to break it. Yeah, I don't think he was going to break it. Um, anyway. Pargo thought he did was going to, but yeah, that wasn't going to happen. Not a pass guy. Yeah. And then uh, and then Perk came in, um, and ironically, through some things we do in the community, Perk's been involved. Like you know, some of our championship weekend stuff, yeah. and the you know, he, so I got to know him a little bit, and he was actually my daughter's favorite player. So I knew Perk a little bit, so that made it a little easier. Yeah. You know, that you know him, and he was always so sweet with my kids, so that makes it a little easier, too. Yeah. And then you kind of think, because you know what's going to happen, like, how do you want to, you know, how do you, how, if you're intentionally going in, like, you're going to go to second. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you want to be remembered? Do you want to be, be salty on the sideline or, like, embrace it and, and support him? And I just said, let's embrace it and support him. I think yeah. the thing I'm more salty about is Josh Cox. You can tag this when you post it because I think that was the last time I got tickets to a game. They just brought me in to just to just, parade me out as second place. Just, and, of course, my dumb ass just said, okay, I'm in. Yeah, I'll bring the whole family oh, and do man. it. That's funny. Josh Cox is a great guy. He's <laughs> athletic giving, does tickets for us. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that's uh, – he's the guy to get free tickets <laughs> from the insiders okay yeah. so like if anybody's listening don't us. hit yep. him up because he's gonna say no yep but he'll take care of us but uh yeah i've always wondered because i don't i don't have any main records I, I think i just have you know like single season scoring but i don't know you got any. up there pretty high overall scoring though third 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 you bump me i did yeah no i just yeah, i didn't yeah, i'd I didn't left know that. i left third in scoring first in assists oh wow um and then you bump me and i've now i'm like sixth in scoring i've kind of continued to fall down that list um, but yeah, so that's the only one. And I didn't, and like perk too, like I always tease and totally tongue in cheek, but like how many NBA guys was he surrounded by? And how, how it's many, not even that that's not tongue in cheek. It's the truth. And, and then we how love many perk. more, and yeah. how many more games did he play? Like, yeah. so then I, I kind of, again, get the old man salt. Well, you got to I think in some of those records, you have to, you have to reference how many games are played. Yeah. And that's true. And then to be honest, I think they score, they, the scores are better now on um you know counting assists yes when 100%. we played in yeah. college the guy had to fucking lay it up yeah before you, you got damn near had to make the shot if in they, order to- if they didn't if they took a dribble sometimes they didn't count it. it's like well like i hit the guy in stride like uh, for real yeah so like i'd have games and you know everybody's like, you don't pass and i'd go back and rewatch them like i know i had at least four and they said i had one I'm like what the <laughs> fuck you know? Oliver Pierce, man, he used to. It's and I, I always joke too because I, no one wanted me to break Stockton's record. Yeah, so of course they're not counting some of those ones, yeah. and we're running the flex. So anyway, again, salty, salty old man stuff at this juncture. But, uh, but yeah, I was super proud of Perk. It does hurt a little bit when you get mentioned and things like you know. Well, I knew. Intro I, and I just knew. Like that. I knew. Yeah. Just. Because we're all competitive. Yeah, you know? I knew a little bit. That's why I yeah. led off with second mm-hmm. all time. It's like, oh, yeah. Painful. It's like, well, just a <laughs> reminder. But, uh, yeah, I was, um, you know, I think, thank you for sharing that because it's always funny because we don't play the game for accolades. But also when you get done, I mean, obviously they can't take away what you did in your career and your memories, but it's nice to, like, show your kids, like, hey, look at that, number one. Right. And, you know, or like your AU team, like, hey, kids, see what happens when you work hard. I'm number one. And I've done that at Mead High School when I was helping out. I, I did it at the end of the practice one day. Sometimes you do trivia, right? Who's the all-time leading scorer in GSL history? Nobody got it. And I'm like. It's me, you idiots. <laughs> I was leading you. I was, yeah, leading yeah, you I was like, it's yeah. me. And then I, I threw in that, I only played three seasons. I yeah. only played four, so even better. You know, like, so I get it. That's why I asked you. Um, so let's segue into you being director of Hoop Fest, yep. Spokane Hoop Fest. Started in what, 2014? Uh, I, st- I started there in 2014. 2014. Yep. Yep. How did that? How did this opportunity come about? Yeah, so long time. They had a long time executive director kind of founding committee founding board members that really built hoop fest into what it was so 2014 was the 25th anniversary of hoop fest so it started in 1990 uh that gentleman's name was rick stelton pole he was transitioning out yeah. so the the board of directors um went out to kind of a, a public you know um posting for the job and i think they had like thousands of candidates oh i'm at sure this juncture because it was already it was you know, already it, larger than spot. Yeah. yeah it was already the biggest and best in the world of what it is and so I didn't even realize that it was posted. It wasn't something I was looking for. I was working for a local insurance company here um, in town. And I had a board member call me, um, Terry Kelly, legendary mm-hmm. basketball player in his own right, local um, and very, very instrumental in, in the growth of Hoop Fest and, you know, basketball family. 
um, he said, would you be interested in this? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know what it means. Cause all I knew of was what most people think of is that it pops up on a ran a weekend in June. <laughs> it's madness for a weekend. And then it then, goes away. Yeah. Uh, had never played in it. Um, had come, come down as a college athlete, um, student athlete and, uh, you know, enjoyed the weekend and the energy, but never yeah. uh, got to play. And then as at this juncture in my life, uh, my oldest son had played, so I'd coached in it a couple of years. Yeah. And so I don't really know what that means. And I said, he's like, well, you know, he kind of explained a little bit, a little bit more about the organization. He's like, if you're interested, you have to put in a resume and actually apply. I was mm -hmm. like, okay. So I took my son down, my oldest son, and we go to my office where I was working at the time. And I'd go to resumebuilder.com. <laughs> you know, I've never done a resume before. And I'm <laughs> plugging in this stuff. And my son goes like, what are you doing, dad? And I'm like, well, I'm building this resume. He's like, what's a resume? And you kind of go through it. And mm -hmm. He was like, why? I was like, well, there's this job opportunity that if I want to learn more about, I got to submit my resume. And he goes, what's the job opportunity? I go, do you really want to know? He's like, yeah. It's like, it's hoop fest. And his eyes get really big. He's like, oh, it's hoop fest. And then he kind of thought for a second. He's like, what does that mean? And I'm like, I don't know, man. That's why I'm, that's why I'm completing. That's why I'm on resumebuilder.com. You're trying to figure this out. Um, and so I put it in, put in my resume. And the more I learned, then the obviously the more I learned, the more I went through the whole interview process from individual phone calls, small committee, uh, hiring committee to the full board interview mm -hmm. um, and got to a point where they offered me the job. And mm -hmm. um, it was just too unique not to try. You know, basketball is too, uh, well, I take that back. My first job after I was done playing ball at 30 years old was financial services. Okay. So pretty sophisticated, working with high net worth individuals and families, very smart people. Um, I uh, was, for I mean, tongue in cheek here a little bit, but I was always the dumbest dude in the room, yeah. right, with these people. Yeah. Then you move to insurance. I moved to insurance after five years in financial services, and insurance is crazy sophisticated. And jokingly, I say they make it so sophisticated that you need people, a professional in the middle to explain it to you because yeah, it's just, it's trying un to fuck you over right. what they're trying to do. Right. And it's just, <laughs> it's so, it's so it's really sophisticated. So I learned an, a little bit of the language of financial services, learned a little bit of the language of um, insurance. Uh -huh. And then when HoopFest came back, I was like, this is my native tongue. Like oh. I speak basketball. Yeah. Like I, I'm not, I'm no longer, I'm not the smartest dude in the room, but I'm no longer the dumbest. I yeah. can carry a conversation. I'm credible. And I believe in the power of community. So it's like, this is pretty, pretty rare and unique. Uh, and so 2014, they offered me the gig in April, April, May, and June. Um, end of the June was the 25th anniversary. And yeah. we've been just trying to so, survive, weather, grow it since then. Give context to the non-Spokane listeners or even in the areas. Hoop Fest is the largest three and three basketball tournament in the world. How many participants? How yep. many teams? Can you just give it? Just give me the elevator on that because you know we understand it, the people, local listeners, but we have a, a broad audience yeah. that's trying to grow. And it's like, hey man, if you love hoops at any level or just energy with hoops, this literally is the tournament to come to. Yep. On the planet. Can you explain it a little bit? So our mission statement is to create the best basketball experiences on earth. Yeah. Originally when it was found is create the best basketball weekend on earth. Arguably who fest is it's, there's nothing, nothing else like it. And so when I say that, I mean, it's true. We have, you know, 6,000 plus teams of four <laughs> athletes. So 24,000 athletes. We play over 14,000 games on a weekend. We set up 400 this year it'd be 410, but last 2019 was 422 basketball courts. That's crazy. All over three square miles. So if you've ever been to Disneyland, mm -hmm. imagine the geography of Disneyland and replace all the rides with basketball courts. Yeah, see, that's, that's the size. That's a great analogy of scale. or a great scale or whatever. Perfect. Yep. And so we have roughly about 250,000 people in downtown Spokane yeah. on a weekend, and it generates about a $50 million economic impact to the area. Wow. In 2019, we had 43 states and six countries represented just in our registration. Wow. And so to kind of continue down this path, so that was a lot of numbers, but to give you some, you know, some, some breadth and scope, uh, you know, we've had got to work with ESPN when Sports Center came. You know, Nike's a great partner of ours. 2018, Kevin Durant came. Yeah. And you always kind of do these little stories around, you know, they'll come in April and May. And you'll walk them around downtown Spokane. And, like, literally you'll be sitting on Riverside Avenue and going, like, basketball as far as the eye can see that literally. way. Literally. Yeah. Turn around and basketball <laughs> as far as the eye as you can see that way. And they kind of pat you on the head, like, no, no, we're ESPN. Like, we do these community events every yeah. weekend. I'm going, like shit you do yep. and then they come back in june and they look around they're like what is this and i was like i try to tell you man yeah. this is a real thing why it's and, wild yeah and it really is every level of athlete you know you use from recently graduated second graders to we have seniors playing 78 yeah. year olds playing everything in between um every it's our most diverse our most vibrant 
uh, our most inclusive weekend of the year because yeah. everyone's welcome. Yep. Um, and it's just basketball. It's like just if, if you like you said, if yeah. you like a if you like a big event. There's it, we got something for you. If you have any affiliation and love for basketball, there's no way you don't fall in love with Hoop Fest once you see it. There's yeah. nothing else like it. I try to explain it to people too, to, and try not to give them like, oh, it's just I, I'm local. That's why I'm hyping. It's like no, dude. Like you come down here, and the energy is always fantastic. Everybody's always like happy and, yep. and having a good time, le- legitimately. Even if you, know, I stopped playing in eighth grade, I always go down to and just watch and go watch, you know, see yep. your friends. I think the best thing you've guys have done, I don't know if this is one of your deals, but the the app that you guys included yep. to get yourself around, because that used to be kind of the hardest thing. Where the <laughs> fuck is this court? <laughs> yeah. Now you get the app and it's like, totally. boom, you know, you go down here. Yep. The food is fantastic. Then the weekend around, um, you know, Spokane, like the bar scene and stuff. If you're older, restaurants, you know, always do specials and, and concerts and stuff like yep. that is always is great. And then you've had like the like you mentioned like the Kevin Durant like how did you land the Kevin Durant thing because I remember just being down I didn't go see him walk around but I remember this the buzz when people oh, found man. out was it was insane yes like, so how would that come about so uh, multi years multiple years working with Nike they do um, uh, a lot of our merch and apparel and uh, basketball so we have a, a nice working relationship with Nike mm-hmm. um, always trying to get an athlete well Nike has the certain levels of athletes that are the Kevin Durant level that they have to fly everywhere. Yeah. Then you have the, the, I wouldn't even call them B list, but you have that next level of athlete that they have to fly commercial. Yeah. Well, we can't get anyone to fly commercial to Spokane because you got to go through Seattle or Portland or, you know, another hub. Yeah, no, it sucks. And so like the uh, Nike kind of said, the only way we do is if we get this, the top echelon where we're like, sweet, send them. Yeah. And so, but in order to do that, you got to fit in Nike's budget. Cause now they're sending the jet and you know, so on and so forth. You know, all this stuff. Yeah. So on Wednesday of that Hoop Fest, so I don't know how to explain Hoop Fest planning because the one question I got when I got hired was like, is it a full-time gig? You know, like, what do you do the rest of the year? It just yeah. shows up. And I'm like, well, Hoop Fest that weekend is enough for a full-time job. And then yeah. you add in all these other things that we do, and it's it's more than a full-time job. Um, And so, like, we go through planning, and, like, April, May, and June is like an uphill climb that just gets steeper and steeper and steeper until Hoop Fest weekend itself. So, like, you're just it's, – it's a really a crazy – it feels like a season. It's like playoffs in the, in the NBA and then finals, finally, and, then and then it's climax done. And yeah, yeah, okay, done. yeah. It, it, definitely there's a seasonality and a kind of a, a athlete season to it. Um, but the Wednesday of Hoop Fest week, literally we go on, the lights come on on Thursday. Team check-in opens up, our contest, our store, the festival yeah. elements start to happen. Friday's the same. Saturday and Sunday is the tournament. So Wednesday I get a call from uh, our contact at Nike. He goes, 50-50 chance Kevin Durant's coming this weekend. Oh, my God. So I'm going so like, like, I don't know. What is that? What, what does that yeah. mean? <laughs> Thursday was 90-10. And Friday we're doing is ninety nine percent. We're doing run of show on how to get him in and out of Hoop Fest in two hours. Yeah. On Sunday afternoon. Now you know by Sunday afternoon, like you love Hoop Fest, but you're like peace. peace. Yeah. See you next year. Yes. Like see you guys you're next hot. Year. You're yes. tired. It's been yep. a long weekend. <laughs> yep. Uh, and we know that. We think it's great. And so, but he was going to come in like Sunday afternoon at one. And in the other stipulation, this is an important piece of the story: is you can't tell anyone because it was supposed to be. A, complete pop-up surprise so i'm trying to plan with the city police private security nike you know what does that look like how do we keep people in the streets on sunday afternoon and so by saturday afternoon at hoop fest we start to leak it yeah just leak you know it's never like me you know it's like hey adam go tell and then that yeah kind of that's all i heard is from other people yeah and so it was really cool to kind of be behind the scenes and see all this happening and then when he showed up uh it was perfect we got him into the grand hotel uh, got him up to the suite, quick costume change, went over a quick script, uh, and then he was just popped up on the street. Yeah. And it was just m- madhouse. It was I mean, crazy. Game, we were planning for all of Hoop Fest to stop. Like, you might have been in a championship game up at the arena, but once you heard that Kevin Durant, like, we thought that that game would end, everyone would just come. And for the yeah. most part, that's what happened. And he was he was spectacular. I mean, pretty chill. But, like, I got to be the one that interviewed him, so I had a, a list of questions that Nike had pre-approved. Yeah. Um, and the first question was, you know, cause the last time he was in Spokane was his last college basketball game. He lost at Texas oh. in the NCAA tournament here at the regional at the arena. And so they wanted me to lead off with, well, the last time you were in Spokane, I'm like, man, I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not jabbing Kevin Durant. At Hoop yeah. Fest. Are you kidding me? Just start with a downer question. Yes. And Jeez. so I kind of, I did, uh, take some, uh, little <laughs> Liberty, creative Liberty there. And I, I reworded the question on the fly, but he was a professional because he knew I reworded it. 
and he brought he answered it the way the original question was written oh, like he had already okay. gotten the script and so he kind of brought me back on point and then from there on it just flowed but I was, as soon as you do that you know how it is like you like oh i'm dealing with the professional yeah, yeah. i got it just he's dude, done this a million he's times. gonna he's got me like because i'm not an interviewer like i don't yeah. know i don't admire what you're doing here like Thanks. i think it's a whole different uh different ball game than answering questions yeah no you got to have some flow but then also like a high level guy like that you don't want to piss him off right away <laughs> and and we've all known and this is one of my best the things i like the most about kevin Durant, he's kind of an asshole <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Like in a good way? Yep. If that, if people can kind of read what I'm saying, but it's like as a former player and a competitor, I'm like, oh, I kind of like how he's kind of like, he's not jerk to people, but like he'll tell like yep. media guys like, fuck you, like to their face. Right. I, I like didn't, that. I didn't say that. You know, I didn't, you can't put those words in my mouth or no. I but mean, he's it, yeah, that way. Exactly. So like, I'm always like to interview him, you'd be like, all right, I got to make sure I'm on point because he knows if you're bullshitting, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So, but I, I always thought that was one of the cooler things who fest did um you know it's bringing a high level athlete like that and the way you guys just surprised it on everybody because i remember the buzz um what is the most i guess difficult thing or what keeps you up at night leading up to the tournament security? yeah uh security weather yeah um uh general safety i mean it is a uh, it's completely uncontrolled environment it, it really is and everyone's got a backpack and a cooler yeah um open traffic sh- i mean we close down the streets from car traffic, but there's, we're still on streets. Yeah. So, I mean, every form of, um, you know, uh, people being stupid, yeah. uh, that's happened in the world, like could happen. Yeah. And so I think that those things are, I mean, we have a great partnership. We, we, we've done things at the federal level, um, certainly the, the state and city county level, uh, in order to ensure safety, um, but it's still just a lot of people. What's that bill like for you guys? <laughs> uh, you know I mean, it's just stuff. it's significant, man. Yeah. It's six figures. Yeah, um, I constantly negotiate with the city every year since I got here, 2014. We've been negotiating with the city on how to um, structure um, that payment. Yeah, um, and honestly, like always, kind of arguing our value, which is frustrating over and over again to the yeah. point where I mean, we talked about Kevin Durant, but would you rather have me negotiating with the city and our police bill, or trying to figure out how to get Kevin Durant to come back to Spokane? Like, police where do you bill. want me spending my time on? Yeah. You know, um, but it's one that it's it is expensive, and and we fall into the uh, events bucket. I had uh, one mentor of mine said, "Look, man, all events are created equal. Not all events make the same impact." It's true. And so Hoop Fest is one of those unique ones that makes a pretty significant impact. So you're constantly trying to argue that. And, you know, to me, it sounds and feels like common sense, but common sense ain't always that common. Well, I'll say it. You didn't <laughs> say it when you're working with government at any level. It's going to be an uphill grind, mm-hmm. uh, teeth, pulling teeth, all the, you know, uh, it's a square peg in a round hole. All of them fit. <laughs> yeah. But I've always wondered, like, you know, what is the bill? And then obviously what, like, do you guys have, like, security control or? Um, yeah. Re- so you could say, like, I just want police here. Or do they say, hey, look, we got it. We'll We'll station the guys how we want it. Or is it just kind of like, hey, we're going to show up with 25 bike cops, 50 guys walking yep. and 10 patrols. Is that how it works? We kind of have, just- we have one, um, uh, key volunteer. So we have a, a we're a nonprofit as an organization. Yeah. So we have okay. a board of directors. Um, I'm in theory, the lone employee of the board of directors. And then I have a staff of six that okay. are, I'm kind of like the, you know, the, uh, I'm the liaison between the board and the staff. Yeah. And then we have this operating committee, which are about 25 year round volunteers. And essentially they are our department heads. We have someone, uh, who runs just our retail experience, someone who does taping, uh, taping the courts on Friday night, you know, site people. Yeah. Um, well, we have a security person. And so this person's been involved for, this will be year 32. He's been involved for oh, wow. 29, 30, 30, 30 years. Yeah. And he's really developed what we call our operations plan, our crisis management plan, and what we call site ops. And so he is the liaison that works with both private security, Spokane police and mm-hmm. fire and the city. Um, but essentially, he's the captain of that yeah, uh, and helps coordinate it. So when you say, like, do we have any authority or do they just show up and say, hey, we got it? No, this this gentleman here has really done a great job of, of making sure that they remember that, in theory, we're hiring them for that weekend. Yeah. We're paying them. You're paying them. And yes, so there is exactly. a responsibility. Now, they've always been great, so I'm not, not to imply anything else. But yeah. um, but we've always had a person there that kind of helped camp, captain and champion that effort to uh you know to create a safe environment at hoop fest and i think that that's been great because 
it's not just carte blanche to Mm -hmm. a public entity. It's like, wait a second. Yes, we need your help, but we we need it to be a coordinated effort. We all got to be on the same page. We have to understand it so that we can communicate it uh, effectively. And so I think over the years, it's just gotten better and better and better to the point where a a few years ago, we got invited to do a tabletop exercise with uh, the federal government on what would happen if catastrophe happened in an event like ours. Oh, And we had, I think it was, I think, 80 different agencies from health and human services to police and fire FEMA, to city government to I mean, everything. Like, if, if all hell breaks All loose, the feds. Yeah. And so, which is, and then Pretty we're just sitting there going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, uh, <laughs> what are we doing yeah, here? Exactly. You know, <laughs> you're the experts. But what they didn't know is that for the weekend of Hoop Fest, we make Spokane a smart city. Like the, all the music you hear, that's our, we build a network, a wireless yeah. network. So we make Spokane a smart city for our wireless network, but it also gives us site wide PA. Oh, you okay. know, our, our that's digital same. street. Yeah. yeah. Our digital street team, who's in theory capturing content and all the fun stuff that happens mm-hmm. at HoopFest, well, they're also eyes in the sky because if shit happens, Twitter's going to be the first place we see it. See, it's true. And so we're, so all this integration of things that we're just doing that we were already doing, they're like, oh my gosh, you do that and you do that. And how'd you develop this? I'm like, well, a volunteer developed this whole yeah. system. They're going like, this is really more, a lot more sophisticated than what it appears the, from the outside. Yeah. Um, and then to have that, them kind of seeing like, you're actually doing a great job and this is how we can make it better. It was like, and I don't know, it was just, a, there is a lot behind the scenes to make it look seamless and easy hey and and i gotta say it to the you know that's just not me uh you know gassing you up or pumping your tires here but like you go down there with i have three small kids or did and you know 13 9 and and 4 you feel safe Mm -hmm. you legitimately do and you said there's two hundred fifty thousand people it's no joke but you feel relatively safe there's some times when there's uh some fights break out but that's just that's anything like that's not gonna hurt your basketball basketball (laughs) exactly so like to be able to put this event on and, you know, to, to continually have a safe environment and a fun environment and an inclusive environment, like you said, it's really hats off to the city, your organization. Um, it's always fascinated me to kind of get behind the scenes look. Like I said, how much does it cost? I mean, are you is your, you're pulling your hair out in April, you know, yep. trying to, trying to the, figure it out, figure this shit out. Yep. Is there, you know, you ever get uh, parts where you're like, the city goes, well... We can't use this street, so then you got to go further by the arena. Like, how, like, yep. is there any, like, do you ever have any friction with, like, city council or anything like that? Yeah, uh, friction. I mean, we work with them a lot because there is construction. The Grand Hotel, which is a big hotel, um, one of our local families, the Dav- um, uh, Davenport Collection. Yeah. Uh, but the Grand Hotel was built in 2014. Uh, I think it opened up. No, yeah. 2015. But it was under construction in 14. So that took 45 courts away right in the core. And oh, 45 yeah. courts for us is literally the second largest three on three basketball tournament in the world. <laughs> and we have, you know, that's just, a, that's one of our parking lots. Um, and so we had to move up to the arena. Um, there's construction this year. I mean, the park's been under construction yeah, since for 15. This will be the first year that it's back. Fucking ever. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I always like, but we also get great coordination because we have a seat at the table. I think that's yeah. the nice thing about Hoop Fest. And a couple fun examples, like, you know, the Lime Scooters. I tell this to kids a lot because, you you know, you tell them numbers and kids are, they don't, can't grasp that quite yet. But I yeah. say, we're big enough, we can shut down Lime Scooters. Like, literally, you cannot drive a Lime Scooter into the Hoop Fest site. You'll, yeah, break, you'll just stop. <laughs> it just stops. Um, you know, and they go like, well, well, I'm like, well, we can't have Lime Scooters no. flying through. It wouldn't work. Hell no. You know, we just got done cutting the ribbon on um, basketball courts in Riverfront Park, which is a park right in our downtown area um, that has this beautiful inst- court mural installation. Well, the parking lot adjacent to the basketball courts, we actually got the design so it fits Hoop Fest Court. So, like, we oh. actually got to say, like, curbing goes there and landscaping goes so there. We need these dimensions. And so stuff like that I, I even cracks me up of, like, the little things that, you know, because we have a seat at the table, we're able to kind of move some of the chess pieces mm-hmm. around the board and kind of like, no, we need this and this would be helpful. And thank you for thinking of us here um, because it's just one weekend. At the end of the year, I mean, Hoop Fest is just it's a significant weekend. Three days, two days of playing. Right? Yeah. I mean, but it's. Yeah, but to have that influence and have that, um, you know, again, to have a seat at the table, I think is really remarkable. And I don't think uh, many cities would allow that to happen for so long and on the scale that it has happened. Well, and, and to to give a little further context to the listeners that have never been to it, like a lot of this gets accomplished through just people. You mentioned community earlier is volunteerism. 
yeah. which is insane. Because I remember I volunteered one year because my dad cut me off after eighth grade. Yep. You know, just because yeah, I was yep. high level high school players, like you're not getting hurt for a t shirt. Yep. You know what I mean? And yep. and and you know, some people scoffed at that and whatever. But I volunteered to do. I think I had third grade girls when I was a sophomore. Good for um, you. And I left the event. He gave us free shoes, you know, uh, shorts and a t-shirt was cool. But I was like, fucking refing is the worst thing you can do. <laughs> so, like, to have these all these volunteers that, yeah. that show up with a smiling face and some of the assholes that are around just on the competitive side, uh, you know, I, I, I want to make sure that I'm – Letting everybody know it's a fantastic event, but there's parents and fucking yeah. idiots everywhere you go, no matter what you're doing. Um, it's hard. So, like, how hard is that to retain some yeah. volunteers? Because you guys give them free stuff, right? To we do. Yes, help still, out same and, thing. So, uh, shoes are our biggest form of currency. If yeah. you volunteered hard enough and, and lifted, had a heavy enough lift to get shoes, you've earned them. Yeah. Um, court monitors are key. Those are the women and men that manage the court in third grade where you were, you were probably refereeing like calling fouls. You no, know, I was calling everything. It, yep. it was hard. Um, you could call something every, at that age, every at that age, every play, possession, you know, and you have parents, which we can talk about that later. Cause the parents <laughs> thing is crazy. But um, at the adult level, we call our own fouls. Yeah. So those people managing those courts are really just, just there to mitigate, you know, any craziness, enforce the rules, like keep the score, the time. Yeah. And make know. sure the games start on time. Yeah. Like, get yeah, you signed a, in yeah. rules, questions, just make sure it's safe and fun. Yeah. Um, we have learned that the, you know, the court monitor makes or breaks it brackets, uh, Sometimes it does. experience. Yeah. Um, so if you get a good one or, you know, then you have, I mean, hoop fest is magical. If you have a tough one, it can be a long weekend depending yeah. on where you fall on the competitive <laughs> yeah. sanity scale. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a good way to put and it. So, uh, uh, but those are the ones. And then, and then from there on out, so there's probably, you know, between, 600 and 900 of those and we end up with about 3,000 volunteers so there's wow. a lot of ways to get involved from on the weekend to before the weekend to indoors at the weekend to outdoors to sitting to standing to yeah. i mean and we need it all and i, I some I'll often say like this whole event is built on the shoulders of volunteers like we're just kind of stewards the yeah, staff there is staff and we they're hurting a, them in the yeah, nicest way yeah, yeah just and supporting just like, them yeah, you know like making sure they get you know, they get what they need to, to be effective because Hoop Fest is too big for any one person or any small team of people to really understand. Yeah. Because there's too many people happening all at once. I, you know, 8 a.m. on Saturday morning of Hoop Fest, we basically have 25 large scale events that all that start at once. Once. And it's you're wild like, to oh, think. Oh, shit, man. Yeah. There's fires everywhere. Like, oh my gosh, someone needs something here and there yeah. and there. And it's crazy. Um, but if we do our job, no one knows that. We just know it. You yeah. Know, from behind the scenes. And if we do our part and, it creates a, a really a really great experience that people come back. And so you talk about retention on those court monitors uh, and marshals were probably between, I think at the high that I've heard was maybe 64, 65% oh, really retention. Yeah. Um, and then the rest kind of come and go uh, each and every year. So it's been really strong. Um, and of course that makes the event stronger. You get that kind of retention yeah. and comfort level. I mean, you come back the next year, you know exactly what to what do to with do. the parents, yeah, exactly. you know exactly how this flow is going to happen. Yep. And then imagine that after 10 years, you know, you're an expert. Yeah. So that's where we are. Um, but we always, it's always a struggle. Um, those last, like last month on those last, like hundred people, like just, just, <laughs> you know, you're going to register. Just, just do it. Just, you know, do just it. register. Cause we need you so that we can move on to the next piece. That's going to stress us out. Yeah. Um, but it, it's remarkable. And then the other thing that I've found in my role is how overwhelming it is because you think you're doing all these, all, you know, you think you're pretty cool, right? You think you're adding value. You think you're doing these good things and, and trying to do good things. And you spend one weekend around these volunteers. You're going like, I can't even compete, man. Yeah. Like the, what you all cool. do compared to what I do, yeah. like I'm so lucky you allow me to be in the role that I'm in. So it's really humbling hmm. in a good way because being a part of the team. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and like you mentioned it, Spokane is, or Spokane Who Fest is a community event. Um, so to bring in those volunteers and have them, you know, follow the rules and, and make everything go smooth and successfully for a pair of shoes, which is still cool that they do it, but like taking time out of their day, a lot of times it's super hot. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of times you talk about the parents, and then even if you're the at the courts that call their own fouls, there's some guys that get out of hand and gals that get out of hand, and and so you put people in position that they probably are not used to being yeah. in, you know. And sometimes they're just, you know, uh, what's the best word? Not not 
huge basketball fans, but they know the game. Yep. Obviously, but they're not like Yeah, they're not I, officials. Yeah, and and they're not at our level of understanding. Yeah. And that's okay. It's like if I went to a soccer tournament, I know enough, but like if I got somebody to play their whole life, I'd be like, oh shit, I, I yep. don't know anything. Yep. Um so it's always interesting to understand, you know, the security apparatus, the planning of it, how many courts and all that stuff of just how big this event is. And you know, so I appreciate you sharing all yeah. that information because I've always wondered, like, okay, what really happens? Because I, you know, like I said, I just show up, played, and then when I was uh, younger, yeah, and older, let's go look at girls and shit. Yeah, and walk around it's great. Watch, people watching, <laughs> people watching it to go. It's pretty fun. Watch, I want to give watch away. my buddies and stuff like yeah, that. You too know? much of a secret. But when when we got the Grand Hotel and we moved up to the arena parking lot up the north side of the park, people were really. Um, they didn't feel like that was the same. Mm-hmm. One of the the core kind of values of Hoopfest is that, you know, they wanted to have a three on three in Spokane, but they wanted to have it in the streets. They didn't want to be in a fairground yeah. or an arena parking a lot, even though lot. we yeah. are now, but um, they wanted it in the buildings on your, your normal traffic streets to really make it that that was the venue, right? Yeah. That's the, the heart of it. And so when we had to move up to the arena, we're like, gosh, who do we put up there? And to your point, we said, let's put up, you know, 23 to 32 year old males because we know they're going to come back down to the park to check out the girls. So you, we're not <laughs> so, just going to lose them. You know, yeah. we're not going to lose them to uh, <laughs> other parts of Spokane because we want them to come back and be a part of the event. And so we're like, this is what we're going to do. Now, the great irony of it is, of it is, is that's the best basketball on site because it's the Cause it's flat. pavement's yeah, flat. it's flat. So not the I, downtown streets of Spokane. Yeah, no, the, exactly. The great irony is we have the largest street basketball tournament, maybe the worst streets in the world. <laughs> know, you know, exactly. it's like, it's pretty crazy, yeah, but it's, it's all part of the charm. It's all part of the charm. It's like that, uh, you know, obviously living in Spokane, you understand, I've seen that meme where, it's a cop pulling somebody over and says, have you been drinking today? And it's it spoke in res. It's like, no, I'm just avoiding all the potholes. And it's so true. And then you go lace them up and play on it. But that's the beauty of this tournament. It's like, no, nah, fuck it. You're going to play on some slant. Your, your rim might be 10, five at one side <laughs> and nine, five on the other. Yeah. Okay. And you're going to have tape. Your free throw line might be a little bit yep. shorter, longer than 15. Deal with it. And nobody, and everybody just plays. And, and I think, and nobody cares. Like, nobody cares. It's like, just play who, man. Shut just up. Just play. And I think, play. That, like, I think you just absolutely nailed it there because, you know, that's why it stays safe. It's because yeah. when people are coming, like, you know what you're, you're you know, you're, you're, you getting, know it. And that's yeah. what you love about it. It's yeah, what just charming about it. That it's is what, the charm of it. And then if you complain, like, the great thing about street basketball or outdoor park basketball is you can challenge people's toughness. Yeah. Like, just, <laughs> what do you, what? I got to shoot on it too. Do you yeah, deal with exactly. it? I got to deal with it. And so then it gets the competitive thing going. Yep. And it's not this kind of pampered sport life no. that we're so used to. It's, it's, it's really at its purest. And it's, uh, and I do think all that is really, really charming. Um, and again, part of maybe the secret sauce of why Hoopfest has remained at the level and continues to grow and find other ways to to create great experiences. So you started a brand with Hoopfest, uh, yep. Hooptown. What what came you gave you that idea to yeah. you know just to help the growth, the the exposure? What? Yeah. So I it, this was an idea. So Visit Spokane here locally is our um, uh, visitors bureau. Okay. And they were rebranding our city a few years ago. And they, the original motto for the city of Spokane was near nature, near perfect. I remember that which one. It just means we're near Montana. That's, yeah. all, that, that's all that meant. <laughs> so uh, and so uh, they came to Hoop Fest as a community organization, community stakeholder, and said, what do you think uh, Spokane should stand for? And I'm going like, shit, man, there's not a day that goes by I don't talk about Gonzaga basketball. Yeah. You know, there's not a day that goes by. I don't talk about hoop fest or youth basketball yeah. or the power of basketball or like literally how to run a pick and roll versus, you know, I mean, it, no, it's, it's true. Just, it's, it's all things imaginable uh, under the basketball umbrella. And then I'm from Portland and Portland's kind of motto is keep Portland weird. weird. Yeah. So they're like, man, we're not, we're not keep Portland eccentric and sophisticated. Like, fuck it. We're weird. Yeah. Let's own it and move on. <laughs> like, you know? And so I was like, well, let, we're a basketball town. Yeah. Like, I know it doesn't make sense. But a lot of our things don't. I mean, Hoop Fest doesn't make sense. Gonzaga basketball doesn't make sense. It's true. Um, it's like, but, why is the largest three on three tournament yes, here? here. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, what's, how does Gonzaga do what they're doing? Yeah. But those are just two examples. I mean, you look at high school basketball and the way that we go over to the West Side and kick their butt in state. Mm-hmm. You know, we look at State B when they come and that great event. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, you know, event. Whitworth at their level is a national contender, you yeah. know, almost every year. Eastern's on the, what was, was on, on the, the right. up, yeah, up and we'll up. See. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you just kind of start to plug that stuff in. But the things that really made me kind of think about it is like most of these conversations I get to in, on a daily basis are with the retirement community. 
Like they're not even people that necessarily played basketball. Yeah. But they know they know Chet. They they follow Drew Timmy's mom on Twitter. They know the next Jaylen, recruited yeah, class. Yeah. They know and they they know more stuff about you than I know about yeah. you. And then what makes Hoop Fest go is the volunteer effort. So I started thinking about that and I was like, that's why we're a basketball town is mm-hmm. the connection, the way that the sport connects. That it's a common thread because even if you don't like basketball, you still may volunteer at Hoop Fest. Yeah, though there's there's people you can tell that just like, hey man, I want to just go out and have fun right. and a good good energy. Love the community. Yeah. Yep. 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 So like so I was like. We st- so I gave that feedback to visit Spokane and, you know, obviously too narrowly focused for a city's travel, you know, visitors bureau, but it resonated with our organization. So we started looking at names, like literally, you know, searching names, basketball town, basketball city, hoop city, hoop town. Well, come to find out hoop town USA, no one owned it. Oh. Like it was from a trademark. No one owned it. Perfect. So we said, perfect. Cause we're, you know, a small city, big town. And yeah, we're already hoop, you know, hoop fest. So yeah. hoops, hoops matter to us. Yep. And so we, we trade, we were able to trademark hoop town USA. So great. So now what do we do with it? So that we kind of sat on that for a little while. And then we had an opportunity to, um, uh, raise some money to build this outdoor basketball court facility in riverfront park. Mm-hmm. And so we said, okay, what else can we raise money for? Well, over the 32 year history of hoop fest from the proceeds of the event, hoop fest, the organization has, um, built over 32 park courts. So anytime you drive by a park in our yeah. region, you see a hoop fest backboard. That's something that hoop fest is paid for. Mm-hmm. So then you start to look at those two things. Then we're like, come, hmm, let's do a hoop town hall of fame. Let's just start a basketball only hall of fame in our area to highlight, not just the Adam Morrison's and in, in, of the world, but how do we get step back Bobby Jack? Yeah. And how do we get some hoop fest dudes in there? Yeah, no, how do for we real, get, like, you know, just you're... basketball yeah. culture in our community. Um, and so, and then the last one was this idea of city branding. Like how, like let, if we want to make Spokane hoop town USA, what are the things we can do? So we went out to raise some money. Uh, we presented it to multi care health system our one of our partners on hoop fest side uh, and we kind of laid it out as, as I just laid it out to everyone here. And then, and they said, we see the vision, we'll support you. And they wrote us a check for a million bucks. Oh, wow. Oh, and all I could think of was like, shit, we left money on the table. I should have, <laughs> that happened too quick. I mean, I should have asked for more, more money. Uh, but multi-care has been a huge partner of ours on hoop fest. And then obviously seeing the vision when hoop town was just an idea. Yeah. And this was two years ago. This was hoop fest 2019. And since then, we've put, um, you know, about half that money to work building these courts uh, all the way up to the point where city council just passed an ordinance that says that Spokane is Hooptown USA. Oh, okay. So we can actually put signs up on the, in Welcome to Spokane, Hooptown, Hooptown USA. USA. That is cool. Um, and then this, so now we're kind of into phase two. We've gotten great momentum on phase one. And the whole idea, I guess, to answer the question is, is just trying to elevate that identity mm-hmm. of basketball and what it means in our community. And then what, how does that create more opportunity, more opportunity for access to the game, more opportunity for investment in the community, more opportunity for, you know, can we get more, let's get NCA, you know, the second sweet 16 here, not just the regionals. How yeah. do we get, second round. you know, how do we get a, you know, silly stuff. I, I want a G league team here. How do we get a G yeah. League team in, in Hooptown, USA, and no, Spokane, Washington? We are the that? right market. Yeah. It would make perfect sense. Right. Could we compete for WNBA team? Because we're probably a better market on that side than the big markets. Girls basketball uh, in Spokane is fantastic. I could do a whole podcast about it if I can mm-hmm. get Vandersloot on or somebody. Mm-hmm. I mean, if really, like in this area, even though she didn't grow up here, but like the amount of WNBA players that have come from Spokane and played high level is, is, yep. is wild. You it is. You understand that Spokane Com- AU. It's crazy. 100%. And so like, so that's what Hooptown is. How do we continue to kind of build, build the infrastructure for the game of basketball, find ways to play the game of basketball, and then ultimately find ways to engage those that love the game of basketball. Um, And it's been really, really well received. It has great momentum and it's kind of fun. Like, I think we, I think we got lucky with the branding. We nailed the branding. It's really clean branding. (laughs) Um, You know, we we're it it looks, Hoopfest is a pillar. Gonzaga is a pillar, but Hooptown, it's kind of this overarching of what basketball means in a community. So, Last couple things before I get you out of here. I appreciate all the explaining and, you know, kind of the behind the scenes stuff with Hoopfest. Yeah. Because I want to give the listeners again the context. If you're not from Spokane, look it up, understand it. If you love basketball, come to it once and you'll be hooked. Yep. And especially if you have kids or even if you're an old guy that's like, hey, shit, I want to go compete. Yeah. With, and it has a feel of like trying to actually win something instead of just like a Sunday league or yep. whatever, you yep. know, you, you kind of, and then you get the street ball element. Do you miss, um, I don't think a lot of listeners know, do you miss doing the radio for the Zags? Because I took your spot you when, did. when you left. Do you miss, um, you miss doing the radio? Yes and no. Uh, it's a big commitment. 
It as is. you've learned. I have learned. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, and so I was done on the, um, my last year on the radio was the previous national championship run yeah, 17. Uh, in 17. Yep. And so I said, listen, man, I, I've taken them as far as I can go. Yeah. I took them to the first elite eight. I took them to their first <laughs> national chat. I was like, Adam, I was like, I, this is, I can't it's do much more. My back it. hurts. Shit. I'm carrying uh, everybody around this joint. <laughs> Uh, well, as you know, because the guest on your uh, your show a couple weeks ago, Tom Hudson is fantastic. He's awesome. Um, have become great friends with him yep. through that experience and continue yep. to be great friends with him. It's a great way to stay close to the game. It is. On a really elite level yeah. of the game. Um, I thought it was really fascinating because I think it helped me see the game better mm-hmm. because you had to articulate it. Yeah, you have to explain it right away. Yeah. And it it's, can't be, it this, can't be like, it's a feeling like something, you know, yeah. you and I watching, like, we feel like this guy's not going well here, but you don't know why until yeah. you get on the radio and you have to explain it. You have to it. explain like, it yeah. right away. Yes. <laughs> and you only have on the radio, you only have until the ball goes out, you know, under the basket on the until baseline gets, to half court before you got to hand it back to Huddy. Well, <laughs> your style may be a little bit different than mine. Cause I fucking take Ooh. over that sometimes. Mm. And, and Huddy always has to like re-explain the play yeah. and then get caught back up. But yeah, sometimes you're like, all right, I've said fantastic or amazing oh four times in the first half. I got to f- come up with a different verb, or, right? And I can't. So it, it, it's harder than it looks. But you know, doing the games is obviously fun. The time commitment is it is what it is. But it's also like people are like, you got to watch games yep. courtside. Look, like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and then like you know, you see in the inside stuff of the program obviously we played there but you don't know what the locker rooms are like you yep. get a little bit of taste of that um so yeah i I've, i wanted to give that context of you being the previous color yeah guy i think you do a great job thank you i appreciate yeah, that and I, and, and I listen to you i still listen because usually it's you know as you know it's during youth basketball so yeah. i'm going to and from practices and i'm yeah. listening to you and, and huddy i think you do a great job appreciate um, it and it's fun is it was it hard for you did was it like coming out of a shell you are always such a private you know in theory reserved <laughs> unless true. you get to go golf with you or something uh, yeah. um and have a few beers yeah, yeah absolutely um it was hard at first to get the the flow and the syntax of a broadcast mm-hmm. because I'm used to just, like you said, you kind of think it and you're like, you know, it's right. Not in a narcissistic way, but just knowing yep. basketball. So you're like, Oh, I, you know, that's probably what this guy should have done. But it's harder to put it in words or just be like, Oh, that was bad. But you kind of, <laughs> but then also you, you get to be like, it's radio. Like I can kind of make it up. Mm-hmm. And so I can make it as, as good or bad as I want it to be. Also, I like um, that it is radio, not TV, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. So, like, you know, I can just kind of show up and you don't have to worry about other shit. Um, so, yeah, I've enjoyed it. Huddy's great. Yeah. He really is. Like, he's just the easiest guy to work with. He's really good, too. Yes. That's what people don't understand. I'm like, he's been doing this for 20-plus years. Yep. Or this is his 20th season coming up. And, like, he makes it a fucking layup for us. Yep. I mean, you know that. 100%. percent where you're just like... Uh, okay, this is simple. 100%. Um, it is hard to do, you know, fucking Pepperdine, Gonzaga, when you know it's going to be a 40-point blow out Northwestern yep. State. You get that, and you're sitting there like, fuck. Home, you know, <laughs> our post-game shows, sometimes you're like, holy yeah. shit, <laughs> fucking get out of here. Like, fuck this shit, you know. Yep. But And the hoodie's just giving stats. Yeah, he's time, just like, like yep. oh, UPS stats coming <laughs> up. And I'm just, I mute my mic and yeah. sit there and look at my phone and don't say anything to me, man. Yeah. Don't even get, don't even do anything on this uh, break. But yeah, I enjoy it, man. It, it's it's been fun. There's a th- there's a, a timeline too, though. Kind of like what you were probably doing with your your boys. You know, yeah. getting old enough. My daughter's going to be an eighth grader next year, and and you know, I don't know if she's going to make varsity as a freshman, sophomore, junior. Who knows? Yeah. But when she starts that, it's going to be like, well, it's going to be hard. I still think we should tag team it. Yeah, uh, Livingston, it. and then um, because I think it's a great empty nesters gig. You know, we both started with young families, yeah. you know, and then the other thing with Gonzaga that I love so much is it's got to be the best travel conference in the, in the country. It's not even close. And that's, that's one of the perks of it. It's like, all right, so we all know December's and January's in, um, Eastern Washington, Western Montana, Idaho. Mm -hmm. Okay. They ain't fun. (laughs) And you look down the conference tournament, it's the Bay, you know, San Diego, LA. Yes. The worst place you go is Portland. Oh my God, it's a great city, yep. and it's usually not that cold. 
And then, you know, usually we were in Hawaii, Bahamas, <laughs> or Orlando <laughs> yep. in the in the non-conference. Yep. So, like, you literally go to all the warm places. You do. And they travel first class. Yep. And they have <laughs> nicest hotels. Yep. I mean, it, it, so that part was was great. And, yeah. um, I mean, it's all it was all wonderful. I do miss it. But it's definitely an empty nesters type of uh, profession yeah, because with young families, it's just it's a lot of time away from home. You're gone a lot. You know, you do the, the you know, the conference games would be sometimes two in a weekend in the same spot or same area. So you're gone for five days, four days. Yep. So, and then when you come back, you're like, Fuck in yeah, San Diego. <laughs> yeah. It's always, yeah. Every time you try to get sympathy, they're like, but wait, where were you? Well, we had, we had to split the trip between Malibu yeah. and, you know, like, oh, we had to go to out. Stockton. Then we drove to Walnut Creek and I was in Walnut Creek for four days. Yeah. And I played golf and went to, right. you know, not like, a lot of, not a lot of sympathy. And it's like, went to the best restaurants and, <laughs> Played poker and, yep. and then called a game that I <laughs> could call with my eyes closed. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? As far as like, you know, I always get asked, like, how much prep time do you do? I'm like, uh, for the conference games, there's not a lot because once you see them once, you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I bet you do more than I did. I was, I was poor that way. Well, we get like, uh, this is what we we're giving away our secrets, but <laughs> the, the radio team gets to go to the pregame meal. Yep. So people don't realize is like we see the scout of their team that's broken down and then what we're going to try to do against their team. It's just a fucking layup for us. Get out a notepad and a piece of paper and go, okay, so at player X goes to go left. <laughs> he scores 60% of the time when he does that. Move straight to the broadcast. Yes. Looks like we want to get player X to go right tonight. You know, Huddy, he goes, and then people yeah. are like, oh, you have great. Damn, you have, yeah, you just, Oh, killing it, man. Killing it, man. And it's like, ah, that's Brian Michelson scout. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, it's a fun gig. I enjoy it. Uh, but yeah, I just want to give the, uh, the listeners a little context. I took, I uh, filled your, once you left, I was the next guy yep. they asked, and it's been great so far. Anything you want to throw in about registering for Hoop Fest yeah. and all that stuff? Yep. So registration is currently open. So we this year we had to move to September 11th and 12th yeah. based on COVID. It uh, was a blessing in disguise. Quick context too. It was 108 on, last on the the weekend. It was on supposed Saturday to Saturday and Sunday. It would have been awful. For it would have been awful. If we did it once that type of heat in 2015. Yeah. It was the only year I played, and I played <laughs> open elite. Oh. Uh, me, Blake, Casey, Calvary. Uh, and Rob Lippman, another guy, and um, we ended up losing in the sem. We won our bracket and won- lost in the semifinals, 2019, on a two pointer at the end um, against a, a really good Roots team from the west side of the state. Um, that's won our cha- won the Hoop Fest several times. Uh, anyway, it was too hot this last week on Silver Lining or Hoop Fest in June. Yeah. So we're September 11th and 12th. There's lots of uh, inherent uh, scheduling conflicts in September. Yeah. You know, schools in and fall ball or fall sports and uh, shoot interstate fair and football games and things like that. So yeah, it's nothing you can do with the COVID stuff. Though. Nothing we could do. We're just happy to be able to host, have yeah. the event. Um, as again, we're a small nonprofit. So that, that what you all do to support the event, be it registering or heck buying a t-shirt or a basketball, all that goes to keeping the lights on in, in a small business. So it's really, really helpful. Registration is open September 11th and 12th, um, both team and volunteer. You can find information on both uh, at spokanehoopfest.net nothing okay. but net the website and then at Spokane hoop fest on all the um, social channels. Okay. Um, but we're really encouraging because this will be the 32nd year. We just want to get back on the streets, get back to it so that in 2022 we it's can hit the ground running full bore, yeah. full bore back in June where we're yeah. meant to be. Uh, and then really kind of get back to that tradition of hoop fest and yeah. continue to build it and, and do great things and then be able to invest in the other programs that we run. Cause it's, mm-hmm. Spokane AAU, it's Ignite Basketball, it's Eastern Washington Elite, the Fitz Camp you talked about, Adam, that you've coached at several times yeah. uh, and lent your talent to. Um, you know, it's just lots and lots of basketball, and we want to do more. Like, yeah. we, we want to continue to build out, again, the access point. We want to continue to build it, create opportunities to play it, and create um, time to love it yeah. um, through the Hooptown Initiative. So we've got lots of good stuff going. Well, uh, this is all honesty. I think, I think you've done a fantastic job of – Making the brand hoop is always fun, but it's more modern now. It feels hipper, mm-hmm, if mm-hmm. that if that makes sense. Yeah, appreciate that. It feels fresher, um, and it like I mentioned earlier, and I, I can't stress it enough. Like the safety aspect, I've never felt unsafe down there ever. Yep. And like the if when you come to the event, people that have been to it will be like, "Yep, you know, like I get it now." So like I think you've done a fantastic job of taking this brand that was already established, but making it more global if that makes sense or more 
Yeah, you well, you get what just, I'm saying. I, I, like, I take because it's hard, man. I mean, usually when you have uh, transition at leadership, now I'm taking up your time. But usually when no, you have on transition at leadership, like things are broken. Yeah. So like the person, next person, come in and yeah, like you know fix everything, fix up. everything, and like this was already the greatest of its yeah. kind in the world. When I so like yeah. basically, there's two ways to think of it. It's like one is don't fuck it up. Yeah. Right? That's one mentality. And yeah. the other one that the one I chose to use was like, here are the keys of the Ferrari, man. Let's go see what we can do with it. Yeah. It's supposed to be fun. Like yeah. it's an event business. It, it's based in a bas- in a game that we both love. It's yeah. supposed to be fun. And so once we once that, you know, if that ever uh loses its luster, then then you know we'll have to you know reflect and evaluate. But right yeah. now it's just, it just seems like there's a lot of opportunity to um you know, that it's fun and then there's a lot of opportunity to create new things and be entrepreneurial and take some challenges, yeah. some risks and um, and do good stuff in the community. Yeah, no, it's been, it's, it's gotten fresher and that's hard to do. And, and when you have an established brand, I think a lot of brands forget that you have to refresh yourselves. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that's kind of an issue that I think uh, Gonzaga had f- probably five years ago. And then I think Fuey and everybody kind of realized they had to refresh to get the guy type of guy yep. similar to this. It's like refresh yourself doesn't get dull or doesn't seem the same. Every time you go down there, it seems a little bit different. There's something new. There's something added. Um, you know, those two years you did the alumni game, two or three yep. years, you know what yep. I'm saying? Like there's always been different type of events to where every year you go to it, like, Oh, I had a little bit different experience. All good at who fest. So, you know, from the Spokane community in basketball, like it's been fantastic. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, and I appreciate thank you. you. Appreciate you having coming on. Um, I, sorry, I jabbed you with the second all-time leader in assists. <laughs> I had if to. If that was the worst that it got, you did great. Uh, you, yeah. Well, I've never had any bad. Okay, I'll just say one thing. Can you change the favor for the times? You don't have to say anything else. <laughs> yes or no, I'm putting you on the spot. For what you've already asked for. Yes. Yes, it's in the system. Awesome. Yep. I appreciate it. Because so. it's not the Thursday before the Saturday game. So okay. when, you, when you're months out, you have a better chance. Okay. No, I, I appreciate that. And that's all we need to leave it at. Yeah. I really do. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, man, thanks for coming on. And I'll talk to Livingston, our boss at Learfro IMG. Like, you should come back and do a game again. Yeah. I mean, why we not? talked Fuck about it. that. Like, like, yeah. Why not? I don't give a shit. Third mic, I guess. Um, we have them. I know, I know they can afford them. Yeah. Um, no, how, how little they pay us. I know they I, can fucking I think, one. I think we'll probably work that out. Um, yeah, come and on, I think too, like, fun. you know, when that transition happens, uh, you know, over the next couple of years to ease some of the responsibility too, yeah. just to have a three man rotation. Yeah, no, on, honestly, someone's going to have idea. to learn how to do play by play. So we're going to have to give Huddy a break. That might be a little harder, <laughs> bigger challenge. I've tried to like, think I could do it. And it's radio play by plays like r- ridiculously skilled. I mean, and, and people don't realize it. Like, when you hear a good radio guy, he is a pro. And if you just sit next to him and watch, like, how easily he describes it, it's unbelievable. And he takes stats. I know. He, on the legal path. He like, does, I know. He like, does a little chicken short, scratch hey. stuff. And I'm like, what is that? And he does. So then he, what he does is he can look back at, okay, it was 16 to 15. And then Gonzaga went on a 12-0 run at 13-42 in the first half. And Sabonis had two fouls. That that was that was when yes. their the other team's best player got a second foul. So normally, like the bigger broadcasts, I'm just trying to give context. Have a third guy, a producer, or they call him a stat guy. He usually writes that shit down on a note card and just hand it to. You. Yes, Huddy does it all off the on top of his head as, as the game calling. as it's, the game's going. So amazing. you're like, I'm always like, I'm riding his coattail because people are nice enough to. Hey man, I like your broadcast. Thanks, man. I'm like, I, I don't do shit. Okay. Yeah. I just fucking tell you if the play was good or not. And that's it. And I push butte after right after that. So it's like, <laughs> Huddy's, Huddy's one of the best. But again, Matt, I appreciate you coming on and uh, look forward to, you know, who fest this year, even though it's, it's delayed, but it's probably a marvel that you guys even figure that out. Yeah. COVID shit. Thank you. Congrats on all your success, man. And thanks, thanks. For, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, no problem. All right, man. you enjoyed this episode of the perimeter make sure to go check out sack and jack featuring two zag alums one from the court robert zachary and one from the booth jack ferris that's sack and jack find it wherever you listen to podcasts the perimeter with adam morrison is brought to you in partnership with speak studios and mercedes of spokane